appreciate all those quotes. They're wonderful quotes. They're wonderful ways to live as well. But MLK also, he brought the thunder too as well. And um, what I'm going to do now is uh, read his letter from Birmingham Jail. And I don't know if you're all familiar with this letter. I'm just going to give a little bit of background for it. So in, in 1963, a group of um, eight white clergy in Birmingham wrote a letter to Martin Luther King called A Call for Unity. It was in response to some recent civil rights activities and protests that had happened within their city. And because of those activities, MLK had been arrested and he was in jail. So he received this letter from these clergy. Um, among those eight clergy were, were two bishops of the Methodist Church, two bishops of the Episcopalian Church, an auxiliary bishop of the Catholic Church, a rabbi, a Presbyterian moderator, which would be similar to the bishop in the, in the Presbyterian Church, and then a pastor of a large Baptist church in town. So they're all based either in Birmingham or close to it. So these eight came together, wrote this letter, this, this call for unity. So in the letter, they took issue with events that were, quote, directed and led in part by outsiders, which would be a reference directly to MLK, who was um, not based in Birmingham, but based in Montgomery, Alabama, and been doing other work in the South as well for this time. So this is before a lot of the really big events that we're familiar with about MLK. So this is, this is still 1963. They had called on the protesters to engage in negotiations with local political and business leaders and to use the courts if needed if their rights were being denied. So that's what this letter written to MLK in jail is saying. So in response, four days later, MLK wrote what is the letter from Birmingham jail, which, I'm gonna, which I am going to read. And I like this letter, and the reason I really like it and the reason I'm going to read it this morning is it explains very directly why MLK was doing what he was doing, the reasons for that. The, so he responds to these critiques or these suggestions from the, from the clergy. But he also goes beyond that. So in addition to answering the critiques, he provides a challenge to these clergy members that I think really applies to us today, and especially us as Christians in the church. And it's to make sure that we are still committed to justice for all around us. And that order and peace is not sufficient. That's not undesirable necessarily, but it's not sufficient if there is still injustice. So following the reading, I'm going to then read the scripture for today from Amos, and then I'll have our sermon. But So we're going to read the letter, we're going to read the scripture that goes with it, and then um, we'll move on to the sermon. So here's the letter. It's written um, April 16th, 1963. And it um, says, My dear fellow clergyman, while confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your secret statement calling our present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom, if ever, do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and your criticisms, criticisms are sincerely set forth, I'd like to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. I think I should give the reason for my being in Birmingham, since you have been influenced by the argument of outsiders coming in. I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization operating in every southern state with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have some 85 affiliate organizations all across the South. Several months ago, our local affiliate here in Birmingham invited us to be on call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such was deemed necessary. We readily consented. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic, basic steps. Collection of the facts to determine whether injustices are alive. And then the second one is negotiations. Third is self-purification. And fourth is direct action. We've gone through all these steps in Birmingham. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of police brutality is known in every section of the country. Its unjust treatment of Negroes in, in the courts is a notorious reality. There have been more unsolved bombings of Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than in any city in this nation. These are the hard, brutal, and unbelievable facts. 
On the basis of these conditions, Negro leaders sought to negotiate with the city fathers, but the political leaders consistently refused to engage in good faith negotiation. Then came the opportunity last September to talk with some of the leaders of the economic community. In these negotiating sessions, certain promises were made by the merchants, such as a promise to remove the humiliating racial signs from the stores. On the basis of these promises, Reverend Shuttlesworth and the leaders of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights agreed to call a moratorium on any type of demonstration. As the weeks and months unfolded, we realized that we were the victims of a broken promise. The signs remained. As in so many experiences in the past, we were confronted with blasted hopes, and the dark shadow of a deep disappointment settled upon us. So we had no alternative except that of preparing for direct action, whereby we would present our very bodies as a means of laying our case before the conscience of the local and national community. We were not unmindful of the difficulties involved. So we decided to go through the process of self-purification. We started having workshops on nonviolence and repeatedly asked ourselves the question, are you able to accept the blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeals of jail? You may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, etc.? Isn't a negotiation a better path? You're exactly right in your call for negotiation. Indeed, this is the purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and establish such creative tension that a community that has, con that has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. My friends, I must say to you that we have not made a single gain in civil rights without legal and nonviolent pressure. History is the long and tragic story of the fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Individuals may see the moral light and give up their unjust posture, but as Reinhold Niebuhr has reminded us, groups are more immortal. I'm sorry, groups are more immoral than individuals. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given up by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have never yet engaged in direct action movement that was well timed, according to the timetable for those who have not sufficiently, who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I've heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with a piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. It has been a tranquilizing thalatomide, relieving the emotional stress for a moment only to give birth to an ill-formed infant of frustration. We must come to see with the distinguished jurists of yesterday that justice too long delayed is justice denied. We have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed for the goal of political independence, and we still creep at horse and buggy pace for the gaining of a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. I guess it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you see vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with impunity, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech, sta speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television, and see the tears welling up in her little eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to colored children, and see the oppressing, the depressing clouds of inferiority begin to form in her little mental sky, and see her begin to distort her little personality by unconsciously developing a bitterness toward white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking an agonizing pathos, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated day and night by nagging signs reading white men and colored, where your first name becomes, and then he uses the N-word, I'm not going to share, and your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John. And when your wife and mother are never given the respectful title of Mrs., 
when you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over, and men are no longer willing to be plunged into an abyss of injustice when they experience the bleakness of corresponding despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the last few years I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's greatest stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goals you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically feels that he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time and constantly advises the Negro to wait until a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. You spoke of our activity in Birmingham as extreme. At first I was rather disappointed that fellow clergymen would see my nonviolent efforts as those of an extremist. I started thinking about the fact that I stand in the middle of two opposing forces in the Negro community. One is the force of complacency made up of Negroes who, as a result of long years of oppression, have been so completely drained of self-respect and a sense of somebodyness that they have adjusted to segregation and a few Negroes in the middle class who, because of a degree of academic and economic security, and at points they profit from segregation, have unconsciously become insensitive to the problems of the masses. The other force is one of bitterness and hatred. It comes perilously close to advocating violence. It is expressed in the various black nationalist groups that are springing up over the nation, the largest and best known being Elijah Muhammad's Muslim movement. This movement is nourished by the contemporary frustration over the continued existence of racial discrimination. It is made up of people who have lost faith in America, who have absolutely repudiated Christianity, and who have concluded that the white man is an incurable devil. The Negro has many pent-up resentments and latent frustrations. He has to get them out. So let him march sometime. Let him have his prayer pilgrimages to the city hall. Understand why he must have sit-ins and freedom rides. If his repressed emotions do not come out in these nonviolent ways, they will come out in ominous expressions of violence. That is not a threat. That it is a fact of history. So I have not said to my people, get rid of your discontent. But I have tried to say that this normal and healthy discontent can be channeled through the creative outlet of nonviolent direct action. So in spite of my shattered dreams of the past, I came to Birmingham with the hope that the white religious leadership in the community would see the justice of our cause and with deep moral concern serve as the channel through which our just grievances could get to the power structure. I had hoped that each of you would understand. But again, I have been disappointed. I've heard numerous religious leaders of the South call upon their worshipers to comply with the desegregation decision because it is the law, but I've longed to hear white ministers say, follow this degree because integration is morally right and the Negro is your brother. In the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro, I've watched white churches stand on the sideline and merely mouth pious irreverencies and sanctimonious trivialities. In the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice, I've heard so many ministers say, those are social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. And I've watched so many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion, which has made a strange distinction between body and soul, the sacred and the secular. I hope this letter finds you strong in the faith. 
I also hope that circumstances will soon make it possible for me to meet each of you, not as an integrationist or a civil rights leader, but as a fellow clergyman and a Christian brother. Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities. And in some not-too-distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood, Martin Luther King, Jr. That's a letter from a Birmingham jail. Pretty, man, I just, I read that and it really gets me thinking. It kind of cuts my heart a little bit. And I know a lot of you lived through that in a way that I didn't. And you have some experience about what was happening, when it was happening. But I just, I think it's a good reminder to read this and to know what he was thinking at the time. So I'm going to move forward. So I said I would read that. Now I'm going to read the scripture from Amos. This is a scripture that is often used on Martin Luther King Jr. weekend. I'm going to read that. It's it's chapter 5, verses 1, I'm sorry, verses 21 through 24. And then after that, I'm going to kind of combine those two readings to be the basis of the sermon. So this is the book of Amos, chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. It says, I hate, I despise your religious festivals, Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river. Righteousness like a never-failing dream. May God bless the reading of God's word. Now, Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For indeed, you are our rock and our redeemer. The Martin Luther King Jr. Weekend. I'm going to start with a little bit of a confession. I don't know how I ended up with a Sunday dedicated to MLK. Last year, we, we mentioned MLK, and we, and we honored him, and I think that's appropriate. But it's not something I would generally make an extra effort to do, to honor a, a man, a, a human. And there's a couple reasons why I want to do that. The first is, so why I very much believe in justice, that the church has a role in justice, I'm still hesitant to devote time to an individual. Because I want to be clear that when we worship, when I make a proclamation from the pulpit, when I say something up here, when anyone says something up here, our focus has to be on the Lord, right? Number one, it is on the Lord. That is our foundation. We must always be focused on Christ. And I never want to make it seem like any of us is being elevated to the level of Christ. That's why I'm, that's one reason I'm a hesitant on it. I'm a big fan, and I admire the work of Martin Luther King Jr. He was a great American. He was a great man. He was a minister. And I do believe he tried to follow the Lord. But he was also a man. He was a flawed man. He was sinful in ways that became public, and that I think a lot of us know about. Which, of course, puts him on the same level as all of us, right? And nothing that he has done or any other member of that movement, as great as it may have been, 
And it was very great. And it moved our country forward. It doesn't compare to what Christ has done for us, right? So I always want that to be clear. So that's one reason I'm hesitant. And the second reason I am hesitant is that I am hesitant in general to speak too much about political matters. I try not to do that too much from the pulpit. And there's a variety of reasons, but the main reason is that they can be complex and nuanced political issues. And people of God, people who worship the Lord, can in good faith come to different conclusions about political matters without meaning they're any less of a Christian. I really do believe that. So that's one reason I don't jump into that too much. And I think that's something that can be lost. And if we focus too much on political matters, it's not good outcomes for the church. It leads to a spirit of division. Or perhaps emphasizing things that are not the core of what it means to be a Christian. Doesn't mean that we should say nothing about anything ever. Right? Doesn't mean we don't, we don't do that. Or we don't want to be silent in the face of an evil. But it means that we have to be careful and cautious and deliberate in the things that are spoken in the pulpit. So those are the two reasons I, that I'm hesitant to really do something like this today. But, it's, but with that said, it's usually about this time of the year, this weekend, where I start to waver a little bit on my hesitancy. And it has nothing to do with, say, the upcoming presidential campaign, which I'm sure we're all very excited about, right? It's nothing about elections that make me waver. It's, but it's because of these two readings. The first, the letter from Birmingham Jail by MLK, and the second, that reading from Amos, which is often, as I said, used as a scripture reading for MLK specific worship service. They really challenge me. And I hope they challenge you a little bit too. They cut to my heart. I want to spend the rest of this morning speaking on them. It concludes with some thoughts about what it might mean for Main Street Church. So I'm going to start with the letter. And I'm not going to spend too much time on it. It's not scripture. So I don't want to spend too much time on non-scripture. But I think it's, there are some lessons that we can glean from it that fit well with the reading from Amos. The first is a section where MLK talks about the white moderate. I don't know if you guys caught that and, and reflected on that a little bit. It hits me. Because I'm the white moderate he's referring to. I imagine many of us fall into that as well. We are the white moderates. And I don't mean, and I don't think moderate in the sense of like the political you know, spectrum. It doesn't mean you're like a moderate Democrat or a moderate Republican. That's not what he's talking about here. I don't think. I think he's, it's not the political views or the policies that are the moderate here. It's the temperament, how you approach the issues of the day, how you approach others. And then specifically what MLK calls out is how we approach the issues of injustice. As moderates, we want to be nice. We want to be tolerant. We want to get along. We want to keep things orderly. We don't want conflict. We don't want to rock the boat too much. We want slow and deliberate change. Nothing too fast. Nothing that gets us out of our comfort zone. And I'll say that the moderation in this sense is not necessarily a bad thing. Okay? I'm not condemning that not as harshly as, as MLK was, but it's not a bad thing. Or not even something we should flee from. And actually, in our current political climate, such as it is, it's probably a virtue and something we should, we should embrace a little bit is that more moderate embrace of, of the issues. But moderate is not, moderation is not necessarily something good when it comes to injustice. So we've got to be careful on it. In the letter, MLK says he's been gravely disappointed in the white moderate. He says it's the white moderate, not the outright racist, you know, the KKK and those kind of groups, but the white moderate that is a great stumbling block towards freedom for the black population. Think about that. He said, for the white moderate, it's more important to have order than it is to have justice. 
It's more important, it would be preferable to have a negative peace, an unjust peace, if that peace is without tension, than it is to have a positive peace with some tension, which has the presence of justice. He speaks of some of the ways that the white moderate may speak about issues. I agree with your goals, but don't agree with your methods. Or they might say it's moving too fast. It has to be more deliberate. Or it has to wait till a time that it's more convenient. Which, of course, raises the question of convenient for whom? Right? For MLK, the lukewarm acceptance of the white moderate was more bewildering than the outright rejection of the racist. You know who else talked about that? About lukewarm acceptance being more bewildering than outright rejection? You know who else said that? Jesus. In the book of Revelation. He spit out the lukewarm churches. We can't be a lukewarm church. Especially when it comes to justice. And we don't have to take MLK's word for that. We take the word of Jesus. But even in his disappointment, MLK did not lose hope. He did not lose faith. He challenged his fellow clergy to look forward to a time when this injustice would be gone. And that he could interact with them as a brother in Christ rather than as an activist. Or merely as a civil rights leader. He wanted that fellowship that Christian fellowship, that's what he desired. That was his hope. And I think that hope, along with his many other dreams, comes down to us still today. Which brings us to Amos, the reading today. Amos is a great prophet. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. It does not get covered enough. Prophets don't, in general, get covered enough. I haven't talked about Amos in the year and a half I've been there, so I'm certainly part of that. And I've spoken to prophets before, and I'm not going to go too much in depth to them and how they work, but I, there's a basic of the prophet that I think is always important to remember. And if you know nothing else about the prophets, I think it's important to know that they generally speak of two things. Right worship and right relationship. Anything that they say can generally be summed into those two things. Right worship, right relationship. They spoke strongly when the people would turn away from God and worship false idols. Um, most commonly, they would condemn those of the, you know, Baal and the fertility cult. So they talk often about that. But beyond right worship, they would speak strongly, the prophets would speak strongly when the people would mistreat the most vulnerable in the population, especially the widows and orphans and the foreigners. They mention those three groups quite often an emphasis on those groups. But mostly they're talking about the vulnerable in society. And when people would mistreat these vulnerable populations, especially for their own economic gain, they would hear the condemnation of the prophets. So to mistreat the vulnerable is to break the social covenant that God had with his people. It was breaking the law of Moses by mistreating them. If you are mistreating the vulnerable, you are breaking the law of God. That's what they're saying. Especially true in the book of Amos. He was vehement, especially vehement, especially tough about the lack of social concern. I'm going to give a little context for this, just so we, we understand what he's saying. This was a pretty unique time in history. We've talked a little bit about the history of Judah and Israel and what was happening there, right? There was a couple centuries after the Golden Age. So we know about David and Solomon. It was a very strong, wealthy nation. Then it split, and then it kind of went in its own ways, and there would be enemies would come, and they would kind of be down, and then up. But right now, when Amos emerges, this is the strongest that those empires or those kingdoms were, and the strongest they'd ever be again. So it was a time of strength, of of wealth, of power in these kingdoms. And it was the last time they would see this. But they didn't know that at the time, right? They thought, okay, we're on the upswing. It's a revival. We're returning to our glory days. But this time of revival covered up significant social injustice. The wealthy elite 
We're getting wealthier, there's no question about that. But alongside the wealthy, there was, there was significant poverty. And there was this Baal worship. And this emerging wealth gap, combined with the rise of worship of Baal, brought along the prophets. So there was wrong relationship, wrong worship. The prophets come in and they speak directly to that. Here's how my commentary described what was happening. The erosion of Israel's social structure showed itself primarily in a cleavage between the rich and the poor. The improved economic situation in Israel led to an increase in the wealthy, who not only neglected the poor, but used them to increase their own wealth. The social concern inherent in the very structure of what Moses had taught them was forgotten. God's will, as applied to Israel, was ignored. And that is what led to the rise of the prophets and spurred them into action. And the words of the prophets were mostly ignored by those in power. It did contribute to this, but it did contribute to the establishment of a believing remnant. There were people who would listen to the prophets and try to follow what they were saying. The, pro- the prophets preserved faith in the people by assuring them that God had not forsaken his promise. And it says they saw emerging from their fallen society a kingdom different from any other. An ideal kingdom headed by a messianic king whose rule would be completely just. Do you see any parallels here? That sound like something that we might be familiar with? Anything we can glean for the world today? This is the story of humanity and the story of faith. When wealth increases, it leads to more injustice, as well as it turning away from the Lord. It happens again and again and again throughout history. Wealth and comfort, it leads to moderation, to protecting what you have, of not wanting it challenged too much. No matter what injustice is happening outside our walls or down the street or in the community. And God notices. God notices. And grand proclamations of faith, impressive worship, beautiful buildings, they don't mean anything to God as long as it's being used to cover up injustice. So throughout this book, and and particularly in this passage, Amos criticizes many aspects of the people and their faith. He's critical, very critical. But what he says here, if we go back to the reading, is that God hates their religious observances. Hates them. And this word, this um, Hebrew word for hate, is the same that was used to describe the attitude Israel should have against evil. So in the same way we should hate evil, God hates their worship. Hate. And he was using this word to describe things that they thought would be pleasing. What they thought they were supposed to be doing to worship. The religious rituals they were supposed to do, such as the festivals. And think about what we do, right? Worship music, the Lord's Prayer, communion. What if someone came in here and said they hate that? God hates that we do that. That would be the comparison. We hate that you do the Lord's Prayer. And the hate is not because of the actions themselves. It's not the festivals wasn't what he hated. It's because we do them, or they did them, hopefully we don't do them, but they did them with a lack of love, concern, and humble obedience to God. That would mark a sincere faith. Every part of the worship was disobedience and mockery of God because it ignored the heart of the law, to love God and love others in the community. They were failing at those most fundamental aspects of the law. So what did it matter how they worshiped? God doesn't care about our building. God doesn't care about what the building looks like. He doesn't care about our style of worship music. doesn't care about our prayers. doesn't care about our communion. God doesn't care about what I'm saying right now. He does not care about any of that if it's not done in a spirit of love and a spirit of justice. That's what he's telling us. He doesn't care what we do if it's not done in a spirit of love and a spirit of justice. We have many people here who care about many things in this church, right? And that is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. We should strive to do the best we can and to honor God the best way that we can in all that we do. We should strive for that. But it really doesn't mean much to God 
if it's not done in the spirit of love and justice. All right? It's justice that will transform worship that is not pleasing the Lord into worship that is acceptable to the Lord. That is what God wants, is worship based on his justice and his love. And we must do it in the, in the service of advancing the justice of the Lord. Only when our faith and our worship inspires us in our interactions with others, both within this church, within these walls, and outside these walls in the community, only when it does that will the Lord accept our worship. Think about Main Street right now. We are unsettled about many things. And we're hitting a point where we have to make some tough decisions in the upcoming weeks and months. Which is, again, why I really encourage people to stay for the annual meeting. We're going to talk about some of those things in two weeks. But no matter what those decisions are, how we move forward, what our building looks like, what our worship looks like, what the sermons are like, it doesn't matter if it's not done in a spirit of love and a spirit of justice. Our concern for justice must roll on like a river, like a never-ending stream. Occasional moments of justice or momentary flows of concern for justice, they're not sufficient. It must be permanent. Justice and righteousness must be the hallmark of the people of God, of us. Remember, we're not a faith measured by the power of our leaders or the things that we have control of or the order and peace and moderation in our life. That's not what our faith is based upon. Our faith must transcend that. Justice and right worship. Not empty worship devoid of love and justice. So what does that look like? What does that look like at Main Street? What should we commit to at this time? What is the injustice that we must speak to? I can't answer that right now. I wish I could tell you this is what we must do and it'll all be set. I don't know. And it's not because I'm holding it from you or I'm waiting for a better time to share it because I don't know. It's that we have to figure out together. We have to figure out what God is calling us to do as a church. That's what we have to figure out. We have to be rowing in the same direction. Bringing justice that rolls on like a river. Within these doors and out in the community as well. And I've said, and I really believe, and I've said it many times, that I believe that Christianity as a whole is on the verge of revival. I really, truly believe that. But I think it's really up to us if we want to be, how and if we want to be a part of that. It's up to us how we want to be a part of that revival. Do we want Main Street to be a part of the revival? Or do we want it to be a part of moderation? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. Being part of revival involves taking seriously what God tells us he desires from us. We should listen to him. Let's think of the ways that we can make justice roll on like a river. And quite frankly, what other choice do we have? What other choice do we have? So next week, Renee is going to share a message on living, on the mirac- living in the miraculous light of Jesus. And after that, there's going to be a three-week series on 1 Corinthians involving practical ways to employ our faith. That's what we have coming up. And then from there, we go to Lent. That's the journey ahead of us. The Lent series is going to be about the mission of Christ. We are going to learn that stuff, but really, it's up to us to come together and be a part of this journey of how we're going to start moving towards justice. But really, the start of that journey comes from coming to the table. So let us do that now. Would you pray with me?